welcome back. In this video, we will be looking at secure application designs. So we'll start with the um, architectural level first. So in architectural level, there are six main types of security uh, patterns that you can apply. Uh, this includes a single access point, a checkpoint pattern, a role pattern, distrustful composition, a privilege separation, and deferred kernel. So we're going to have a look at each one uh, in, in a bit more detail uh, with using an example. Okay, So our basic system looks like this. So you can kind of depict some an organization system where you have some internal users uh, connected within the system. Uh, so this person figure uh, represents like a host machine. Um, and then you have like uh, different subsystems that provides like different uh, applications and services. So maybe you have a separate subsystem for storing databases, uh, printing facilities, or anything else, right? So this is what we're working with. And it may be connected to outside as well. So there are some uh, doors connected to outside. So first one, a single access point pattern, uh, as it sounds, it's quite straightforward. What you're trying to do is provide only a single point of entry to the system. So all the incoming uh, requests will go through that particular point for inspection. So this is useful, especially when you're trying to um, install firewall, you want to make sure that all the traffic will flow through the firewall and every single time. Okay, And because we are inspecting everything that goes through that particular point, uh, any unauthorized requests of any other component of the system are directed to this point and can be filtered out. Okay, So there are not just firewall, but other, um, other ways to implement these types of um, patterns. For example, Java Enterprise Edition, JEE, uh, supports uh, with declarative security implements through web containers, for instance. Okay. So it doesn't have to be like a physical system itself, but it can also be like a, um, within the web services or applications uh, and so forth. Okay. So this is, so by implementing a single access point pattern here, what we're going to do is add another layer of um, access and make sure that everything flows through that particular point. Okay, next one is the checkpoint pattern. And basically what checkpoint pattern do is it centralizes and enforces authentication and authorization. And this particular mechanism will determine if access to a particular resource is proper or not. Okay? Uh, a matches user uh, with a level of security allowed. And there may be multiple checkpoints that you have to go through as well. Um, again, uh, JE supports this uh, with Java authentication and authorization service, as well as pluggable authentication modules um, providing, so, um, providing support uh, to implement this pattern. Okay, so it kind of looks like this. So we had our entry points for the system and subsystems, and what we're introducing is checkpoints uh, for um, for those entry points. You don't have to provide checkpoints for every single point, um, but um, you should implement those checkpoints as necessary. The role-based pattern is um, it has an overlap with the checkpoint pattern, but it's trying to differentiate how the user's role may change over time and take that into consideration when people are trying to access resources. Okay? So, so this separates the users uh, from their privileges, where the privileges can vary uh, over a period of time. So typically, users will be given a role, and based on that role, the access will be provided um, for the user. So you can think like you have another layer of um, hierarchy in terms of how we can classify what, uh, who can access uh, what resources or not. And this provides easier management of the system. So it's kind of, so when we depict, depict uh, the role pattern, it looks like this, where certain users may or may not have access to certain components uh, of the system. And to actually realize this, we need to have Oops. We need to realize this, we need to have our checkpoints enabled uh, for those uh, places. 
So that's where uh, the role based pattern has some overlap with checkpoints. However, uh, those checkpoints can only be uh, implemented to where the role based pattern access is required. And next is the distrustful composition. Uh, normally, functionality accumulates within modules, okay, leaving large modules with multiple functionalities and possible mo possibly uh, multiple interfaces and dot text surfaces. So what it's saying is, if I have a component that does a lot of stuff, the moment it gets compromised, then the attacker can uh, utilize all those functionalities overall. So what you want to do is separate those out, and by doing so, you're reducing the attack surface. When we say attack surface, it's re reducing uh, how the attackers may gain access to that particular resource. Okay? So by providing small cohesive uh, units, um, you have less vulnerabilities, and less vulnerabilities means you have um, less attack surface. In addition to this, if we have smaller uh, modules uh, that operates um, with others, then it's easier to check uh, whether, these function, uh, whether these modules are functioning correctly or not. Okay? So in terms of our system, it kind of looks like this, where currently uh, subsystem 3 contains all of the database items, but now we can separate them into uh, both resource files and user credentials. Okay, next item is privilege separation. Um, so this one has a bit of an overlap with the role-based access, um, but role-based access doesn't necessarily have to be uh, related to authentication as in like a traditional where users uh, log in and then you gain that particular role. So that happens here. This is where uh, through an action you are changing your privilege. Whereas in the role-based pattern, uh, you may be able to gain privilege based on your stat status. Okay? So that means if you if you have if you're an empl employee of a place, then you may be given a privilege automatically. Okay? So it doesn't provide the role-based pattern doesn't specify if there are any mechanisms for that uh, person to change its privilege. Whereas in privilege separation, uh, what you're going to do is have a mechanism where the privilege can be uh, changed to enable that user to access different resources. Okay, and privilege separation uh, is part of the uh, dist distrustful composition because what it's going to do is access a resource in order to gain the privilege uh, to access another resource. Okay. So typically it has um, pre-authentication and post-authentication states. Okay. So let's have a look at an example. So here we have a scenario with two different users. If you're trying to access the resource, direct resource directly, um, it's going to get rejected because this particular user has not um, gained the privilege to access resource files. So what you need to do is first uh, validate your cre uh, credentials and gain the authenticate uh, authenticate yourself. Uh, once you have done that, then you are granted your privilege in order to access the resource files here. And finally, uh, there's a deferred, deferred kernel. But basically what it's saying is don't reinvent the wheel. What you want to do is use an existing user verification functionalities within the kernel uh, to avoid uh, reinventing the decision control. Okay? And, and many of the existing kernels will provide these functionalities for you so that you don't have to redo those um, verifications where if you do it yourself, you may end up um, misconfiguring it so that it may become vulnerable. Okay. So something like this, rather than implementing your own crypto and authentication, uh, rather uh, use the ones that are provided through the kernel. So having those in mind, we have uh, general design patterns that you can apply in various parts of the system. Okay, so two examples include facade and proxy. Let's have a look at each one. So facade design pattern uh, provides a unified interface to a complex subsystem. This may seem uh, backwards to distrustful composition, but depending on the system that you're trying to implement, uh, 
uh, it may be better to restrict the access to individual components uh, than what we had before. So in distrustful composition, what you're trying to do is separate out large chunk of, um, uh, of applications. But here, what you're doing is each of those is not grouping those chunks applications back together. But if if the application Functionalities are all separated. We can group them together and provide a, a simple interface to access. Okay, so example is the JDBC interface, uh, which requires client to use three major Java classes. So it has the connection statement and result set for this one. Um, so if you're not familiar with the JBDC, it's the Java Database Connection um, interface, uh, and because it has it also relies on three different classes. Typically, what user has to do is write a function or have an access to each one and interact uh, to create a connection to the database. However, what you can do is cr create a single facade class uh, so the client can access that particular uh, class to interact rather than directly. So this means we are adding adding a point of security where the user is not directly manipulating uh, individual classes, but rather have to always go through uh, this single facade class. Okay, So what you need to do is make sure that this single facade class is secure, then it can restrict the access for the users to manipulate other classes. So it kind of looks like this, where a user uh, used to individually access each class, but now you're going to in encapsulate that inside this Super JDBC. And by doing so, uh, the Super JDBC interacts with these classes, connection statement and result set, instead of the user doing it directly. Okay? So this limits the user's capabilities to access uh, those uh, classes. So there are less interactions that they can do um, to exploit any vulnerabilities that can exist in those classes. Okay. So when you implement facade uh, design pattern, it not, on, it not only uh, simplifies the class structure from the client point of view, you're only interacting with a single facade class instead of multiple, um, but it limits what clients can do. So as discussed before, uh, by cre creating this facade class, it's going to limit what clients can do with all the other classes because you have to go through this facade class. Okay, and uh, using facade, you can uh, pot potentially implement single access point and checkpoint security patterns uh, for that particular class as well. Next one is proxy design pattern. This is to provide uh, varying degrees of access and instantiation on demand to varying clients. Okay, so if you um, remember taking the networking class, proxy is also used. Um, to ensure that the clients in within the subnet is protected from outside, it hides their um, um, identities. Uh, also, when we talked about firewalls, uh, firewalls had a proxy um, settings where firewall can act on behalf of the users uh, to make uh, connections instead. Okay, so proxy acts as a reference to the real object to avoid direct contact. Um, from the external entity, which may be harmful and trying to exploit vulnerabilities. Okay, so instead of um, external entities accessing directly of uh, the applications, the proxy will instantiate those applications on demand and provide them as the service to external entities. So it looks like this. So in system one, we don't have a proxy. That means a client may access directly of the services being provided. However, in system two, we have set up a proxy. So this client must go through the proxy, must ask the proxy whether um, the client can request such information or not. And uh, this proxy will just pass on to pass on the request to the application and respond back. Okay, this may look like it's adding another layer of work, but by doing this, uh, this proxy can implement various features to limit what the client uh, can do to your applications in the system. Okay. So by using proxy, it can help you implement uh, authentication, authorization, filtering requests, auditing, and
and logging as well. So in non-proxy design, you had to do this individually, but now you have a central point where you can implement this instead. Okay. So these are just a few different design patterns and there are a lot of other design patterns that you can actually implement whenever you're developing software. So here is a resource where you can find a secure design patterns technical report for reference. However, it's not going to be examined. Okay. Okay. And coming at the implementation level, uh, we have various patterns that are um, explicit, like uh, secure logger, uh, clear sensitive information, secure di directory, path name, canonicalization, etc. Okay, all of those items can also be uh, implemented, which are derived from the SEI, Secure Design Pattern Technical Report. Okay, so overall, um, when designing for security, um, we need to consider various uh, design patterns that we can implement, but those should be implemented based on your security requirements. Okay, so security requirements, if you forgot, it's uh, covered in the previous video. Okay, and based on those requirements, we can implement uh, only the required um, security patterns in order to provide protection against uh, suspected attacks that can impact our system. Okay, um, of course, it is it could be ideal to implement all possible security patterns, but in practice, we don't have sufficient uh, resources and time uh, to do that. Um, that's why we want to prioritize and implement only the ones that are necessary and where needed. Okay. So once we have finished um, designing uh, the architect and implementation following through, uh, next item you need to do is do some testing, okay, which we'll cover in the next one. So I'll see you there. Bye.